I've known Nikki for a very long time. And I was supposed to take my students to California for a study trip. But of course, that didn't happen. Now I see some of them are joining with Nikki on this virtual um, virtual tour. So I'm excited to see how this goes. It's my first time virtual tour. And this is my little boy, Max, in the background, <laughs> <laughs> who's, uh, who's joining for, for some of the stuff. And yeah, um, I used to be an entrepreneur in the UK. And now I'm a teacher and I teach um, both arts and design and engineering, specializing in experience-based things, making people fall in love with products or whatever it might be that's like the short version and uh, yeah. to me a wonderful friend and inspiration <laughs> we know each other pre-ted um yeah from another conference <laughs> from another conference where we've met and got adam excited about ted it turned into one of the most inspiring tedx curators and organizers in the european tedx community and it's wonderful to have <laughs> you here this this first Silicon Valley inspiration tour is epic to me. It's kind of, a, I'm running the program since 2012. I'm gonna go into this a little later. And this is the very first, so you're groundbreaking participants. Um, next on my, on my screen is Dieter. I want to- Hi everybody, my name is Dieter. I'm from Austria. Um, I work for a sporting goods chain called Intersport and I'm uh, responsible for what are parts in the tourism areas where we do ski rental in winter and uh, bike rental in summer. Uh, I have a family with two kids. They're, thank God they're with their mom at the moment, so I can be really focused, but let's see how the rest of the week turns out. I'm really excited to be part of this um, the first virtual tour. I wanted to join you, Nikki, for I don't know how long, and I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm gonna take a tour with uh, some of my dealers uh, to get our minds open. Thanks nice. for organizing that. Wonderful to have you. Yeah, it's nice. We know each other from LinkedIn. It's kind of a fun thing that these networks create connections that are sustainable for quite a long time now. And we had a session last week and it's nice to keep that conversation alive and even growing. Wonderful to have you in this very first tour. I'm super psyched. Yanis, how about you? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, so, hi, my guys. My name is Yanis. Uh, I'm from Germany, a community builder who has been heavily involved with the TEDx format in the past as well. Um, so this is where I know Nikki and also Adam from. So I think Adam didn't mention that he's also one of the best hosts I've uh, experienced so far. Um, great oh, entertainer great on stage. <laughs> and um, yeah, so currently heavily diving into the topics of uh, loneliness and social isolation, which are uh, bubbling up quite drastically due to uh, Corona and uh, really curious after joining one of Nikki's uh, webinars last week uh, to dive with you boys into this virtual tour and um, yeah so let the show start. Great good to have you. Frederick, yes. we know each other the uh, least. What? We know each other the least. Oh yeah uh, I'm Frederick and I live in uh, Unse, Denmark. And I'm studying, uh, I'm taking my bachelor in product development and innovation at the university where uh, Adam works currently. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, exciting to be able to attend this. We had a plan to like go to a study trip in this Easter and the week before to uh, Silicon Valley. But uh, now we're staying at home in Europe instead. So it's a good opportunity to be able to uh, get out a little bit anyways and explore some new uh, Nice. Part of the world. Good to have you. Anders, good to see you again. Uh, so I'm, hello again. <laughs> so I'm studying product development uh, as Frederick mentioned and I was also supposed to go on a study trip uh, and I was the one organizing this study trip together with Adam and Bent and I'm looking very much forward to get this virtual study trip instead. Very nice, very nice. So great that you've made it into this at least tapping the toes into the Silicon Valley water version. Bent, I don't see you. And I hope you can hear us. I can try to unmute you, that helps. Hello, Bent. Yes, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. We cannot see no. you, but we can okay. hear you. 
Yeah, it's it's because I'm using my stationary PC and there's no camera. So, um, but yes, I'm uh, uh, from the Southern Denmark University and I was actually uh, going with the students, uh, supposed to go with the students to uh, Silicon Valley, but uh, as you know, it's canceled all of it. Um, my teaching, uh, my field is uh, static and uh, materials mainly, and I'm working part-time. Uh, I'm a handsome young man, as you can see on the picture, 68 years old. So, <laughs> uh, but what else to say? Uh, uh, looking forward to uh, see what it's all about. So, Wonderful. Good to have yeah. you in the program, Ben. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, sorry, it's, it's, it's my first time with Zoom, so uh, I had to find out what this is actually on this. So, but uh, I might find a computer with a camera for next time. Okay. So, also to let yeah. you know, I'm recording the sessions and you will have access to the recordings and can revisit the conversations if something went too fast or it's like to look back into re understanding. And, and um, I think that's one of the good tools with, with Zoom that it's really nice to just record the session. Good to have you, Ben. And you, you again, and then we have MD, and I would say that's Maserat. <clears throat> hi, yes, it's, uh, I don't know why it shows up as MD, but hi, um, yes, it's good to join you guys. I, my background is in communications, and um, I'm just on a sabbatical um, for a bit. I used to do comms with a consultancy, but I also on the side, since about almost 10 years now, I do education and development work in Rajasthan in India and a lot of campaigning work to bring girls into education. Uh, and I also part of that whole effort is I organize um, a large TEDx event in, uh, in, in a village in India. And um, yeah, that's my background. I'm, this is actually all completely new for me. So part of my thing in the sabbatical was I just wanted to learn new things and think of like, new different ideas and what I'm used to. So I'm looking forward to learning from all of you. So thanks so much, uh, Nikki, for, for doing this. Wonderful, wonderful to have you all. Um, I don't know, Nasrud, if your camera is off by intention. It's nice when we meet the people to show faces, but if it's easier for you or, or if you prefer not to, not to put video on, it's totally okay. Um, let me jump right into this and go back to sharing the screen. And that will be this one. So the, 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 the first session's purpose is to give you a bit of a feeling and context of what's the mindset and what's the special, what's that myth? What's so, um, what's so big about Silicon Valley? Why are people um, so excited to go there and visit companies? I don't know, like 50 years ago, if I would have told you that in the future I will make I will make my living by inviting people to walk through offices. You might have asked yourself if you, if, if you should be worried about Nikki. And, and now this is happening and people are coming and why is this so and what's so special with this space? And people ask me a lot, what's the diff difference between Silicon Valley and other places in the world? And I thought it's a good warming up to the session. We have a hard cut in 45 minutes um, and Toby will be um, joining us for the first session. So I also hope that you've got all the PowerPoint slides that I've shared by email with you because we're going to go through the business model canvas and he wants to make this interactive, which is a nice start of the whole program. A friend of mine once said the definition of Silicon Valley is 120 square kilometers surrounded by reality. Maybe that's one of the big things that shines out already that when you, when you go to Silicon Valley and you meet people there and you have a conversation very often, you feel like, okay, this works here, but this would never work when I go back home which I warmly disagree, but we're going to go through this right now. And, and if I, so my mission for the program in Silicon Valley, when we have these tours, it's the same group size. We're never more than 10 people. My mission is to change your lives. So that means that I want to encourage you to take everything you can out of these conversations. It shouldn't be a talk to eight people. It should be a fluid conversation, ask questions, challenge people. And we can also, if you want this, we can add another session of a wrap up where we meet again, just me with you guys and we discuss what happened during the week. So I, I guess that might make sense. We do this a lot in the real tours. So we have this every other day. 
but as we only have two meetings every day because of the time zone um, change, we might just want to have this at the end of the uh, end of this program. And I'm I'm just shooting out a calendar invite, and whoever wants to be part of this um, is warmly invited. A little about me, I'm. In 1972 born, I was in advertising. I had this very, very strange career of advertising where I acted in a TV commercial when I was eight. And this TV commercial has been aired for 13 years. And when you're eight until 21, when you go through adolescence, it's not the most um, fun thing to be constantly reminded to the eight-year-old version of yourself. And people are making a lot of fun. But this was kind of a... Um, it's it got a weird, weird fame. And when I was 21, I was actually excited about advertising and I started working in an advertising company that worked for the same bank to produce the first follow-up commercial. So advertising by then was um, a fun, fun business to work at. And I, I think that I was lucky stumbling across TED in 2006 when advertising was far away from being exciting anymore. And I found my new destiny was something that really totally pulled me into. And each of you was part of the TEDx community will, will understand what I'm talking about here. Ted invited me being TEDx ambassador in 2011, which exposed me to 4,000 licensees. And I was involved in over 100 TEDx events, mainly as a speaker coach. And I was constantly in orbit of local communities. And I really enjoyed this very much. And that also brought me to San Francisco, where I stumbled across Singularity University. And we're going to talk about singularity and exponential concepts, exponential growth strategies, this, this underlying principle of what Singularity University is doing a lot, a little later, actually in this first session already. They inspired me a lot with this um, moonshot thinking concept that everyone's talking about right now. I founded in the same year, I founded Innovation Agency Network, which is the idea that we shouldn't wait for a finished product um, to tell a good story so people understand and buy it, but we should actually be able to approach companies and work together with them to develop products. If we understand the company and if we understand the market and the consumers, we should be able to be part of that conversation already. Um, and that's something that kind of constantly was part of that journey since then. My school of talk is public speaker coaching. I was, um, so in, not this year for various reasons, we don't have to dive deeper into, but usually that's the time of the year where I have three to five speaker coaching sessions every day. And when I work with a the speaker, there's usually a reason why the person is invited to be on a stage. I learned so much from these people and I've been working with, I don't know, a little over a thousand, I would say easily being in, involved in so many TEDx events and also with Singularity and other conferences and other universities. I'm constantly soaking in information. So what's happening in, in my part of this journey is I'm just helping you connect dots and I'm bringing conversations to something that is a narrative for you with all the many impulses that I got through, through my work. The Silicon Valley Inspiration Tours got founded in 2012. And since then we had over 120 real tours. Last year we expanded to New York, London, Tel Aviv, Dubai, Mumbai, and Hong Kong. Um, which I think is a beautiful journey and very interesting to compare all these other hotbeds of innovation with Silicon Valley and their own, in, their own personality. Um, as it's very difficult to explain what I'm actually doing, I asked a friend two years ago, how would he put in a phrase of what, he, what I'm doing because he knows me well. He said, hey, Nikki, you're a business therapist. And I thought, okay, I can resonate with this because I'm really passionate on helping you explore what you're really good at to become better at it and to um, roll out the, the red curtain for your future, which is a future led by passion and, and, and driven by bigger things than yourself. And um, usually a lot of these people who are part of the TEDx community, a lot of these people who are part of the webinars and the workshops and trainings that I have, they think alike because otherwise they probably wouldn't, you probably wouldn't sign up if you wouldn't be a curious, curious by nature. So that's a little about me. But before we begin going into Silicon Valley, I think it's very important to get on the same page about the conversation that we're actually talking about right now, because we're not, this is not a, a window shopping week. We're not, we're not so visiting Silicon Valley to have conversation. We're actually looking into something that we all have in common and the, the United Nations put them really well together in the 17 sustainable development goals. And I don't, I'm not going to go into these, but what I think is interesting is what the social progress team is doing. They're in fact basically monitoring how we are doing along the line of, of all these 17 goals, how we're doing along the line of improving the situation, the way we, we treat each other, the way we solve environmental problems, the way we solve social problems. Um, there is a, 
as a little dig, dive deep, dig deeper here on what the SDGs are about and how they can be split into the three groups. And every year they're sharing an update on how we are actually performing. And as you can see, this update is very recently. We're doing okay in everything that improves the environmental issues and we're doing really bad in every of the, each of these targets that look into how we are treating each other. As a matter of fact, when we look into the data, humans are treating each other worse than four years ago. And we're going to see the next uh, announcement of, of um, so they're always launching their, their um, annual updates in September, and I'm sure it's not going to change a lot. So we have to understand that it's not only about method and it's all, not only about technology, it's very much about how we're treating each other. This is a statement I guess you've all heard before, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And if people ask me what's so special about Silicon Valley, I would say the way people are treating each other in Silicon Valley is far different than anywhere else in the world that I've been. So what we're doing there, and that's something that you heard from me a lot when we had this conversation or for the first time um, right now, but it's, it's a common theme and that's the distinguishment between linear organizations and exponential organizations. Now I'm going to race a little through this because I don't want to give you too much into this because it's a race on the surface, but at least it's a good foundation of the conversations that we're going to have during the course of the week. Some examples of linear organizations, Nokia, they had, um, 30 different phones at the end of their, their lifetime. They didn't even know what they were doing right. We have 111 car brands in the world, of which 110 are mechanics, and one of them is a data company. Mechanics always try to be better in what they've been good at. So they produce better cars and produce better engines and produce better in interior design and better sound systems and what. Um, this is not the future of, of cars. The future of cars is not producing a better car, but that's also a different conversation. Um, insurance companies fintech companies and many many others and whenever you've worked with one of them or you're involved in one of them you might agree that they just have a product portfolio for a customer portfolio and it doesn't make a difference if you have 10 products for 10 types or 10 archetypes of customers or if you have 10,000 products for 10,000 archetypes of customers the difference is that every individual goes in his life through a series of events and all these series of events they might have um, a cross point to something that these companies offer. And so they can turn this, this event, this series of events into experiences. And that experience can be that you're only insured when you're at risk. Or their experience can be that you get support only when you need it and you also only pay for this during the time that you need it and many more things. I'm sure that you all heard about examples where companies are working on this. This is a huge difference to having a certain amount of products for a certain amount of archetypes of customers. Kodak is the most um, commonly used example or case study for an exponential or linear organization. So I don't want to miss out using it this time as well, but maybe I'm giving you a different narrative. In 1975, when Kodak invented the digital camera, they said they print memories on paper. That was the claim Kodak offered to the world and was a very relevant claim because we want to capture memories and paper was the medium that was available. What they didn't think of is that people were producing more and more memories and they want to capture more and more memories and in 2017 we produced 14.6 trillion photos and if we would be still in a world where we print memories on paper we would have to deforest the whole world by mid-june and of course this is not going to happen kodak did not not understand digital they didn't make the math on exponential growth patterns and the problem with exponential growth patterns is we can't imagine it. we can imagine 30 steps that are linear when every step is a meter is 30 meters but if we walk 30 exponential steps, where every step doubles in the length, so one meter, two meter, four meter, eight meter, 60 meter, and so on, we would walk 25 times around the earth. And that's something we can't grasp. So we, grasp, so we have to write it down. Ray Kurzweil, the founder of Singularity University says, I always have to write it down. I always have to write it down. What's the metrics and what does it mean on a doubling pattern? Would we reach to hit the ceiling too soon or is it infinite growth possible? And that's one of the huge differences of exponential organizations versus linear organization. I would say that Microsoft is maybe on a transition, but still I would perceive, I would categorize them more as a linear organization because what they do and what's very specific for linear organization is they're trying to be better than a competitor. Linear organizations always look into what's my competitor doing and how can I outbeat my competitor? And that's a huge difference between Microsoft and Apple. There's a great talk from Simon Sinek 
if you haven't watched it, I can warmly recommend where he compares companies who win a war or fight a war to win the war or look into the war and keep it alive until the problem is solved. Um, Microsoft wants to win the war. Apple has a different perception. In numbers, that's or in, in figures, that's the world of linear organization of a very successful linear organization. They're growing by um, selling as many products as possible to their customers. And that looks pretty much like this. When you hear linear organizations, they would ask, does it scale when you offer something to them? Does it scale mean that you have a certain product and that you want to sell to all possible customers? And that would make a linear growth pattern. Whereas exponential organizations see the world a little differently. When we compare Microsoft with Apple, let's see what Apple is thinking about. Apple th says that they want to, they see education as a big problem and they want to make education better for students and for teachers. In his talk, Simon Sinek talks about the fact that Microsoft gave him a, a Surface or so the tablet PC and he really liked this. And when he spoke at Apple, he shared that story with an Apple manager that Microsoft gifted him with the Surface Pro. And that's a really beautiful device. And the Apple manager answered, I have no doubts. The Apple manager did not answer whether the iPad is better. He said, I have no doubts because that's not the war they want to win. The war they want to win is making education better for students and for teachers. And please just like raise a flag if I'm too fast or if you disagree with things. I'm, I'm keeping that pace because I want, to, I want to offer you all of this information and we're going to spend the whole week together anyways so we can discuss it. Also, I want to add that at least for the meetings that I run, you will have access to all the slides that I share with you. So you can also re revisit um, certain, certain slides in the deck that I'm just walking through with you or maybe racing through with you, which would probably be more appropriate. Um, another exponential organization is Tesla. Tesla says that um, energy is a circle and in the energy, in the realm of energy, there are people who are producing energy, people who are storing energy and people who are using energy. Why not take all these three aspects of the circle of energy into individuals' lives? So you can produce your own energy, you can store your own, you can also use your own energy. Um, Airbnb. Airbnb another Silicon Valley example um, been shared many, many times. What they're doing is so obvious that you have to, you, people always have this feeling of good and obvious idea. You always have the feeling of why doesn't this exist forever? And what they understood is that you have unused assets at home, at home. So why not just to convert the unused assets at home into income? Amazon is not really a Silicon Valley company. They're, they're neighbors of Microsoft in Seattle or uh, in Austin. But I would perceive them as an exponential organization. Also, when you look into the five big players, they're part of them. What they see is that life is a series of logistic decisions. Um, and you're not there to be a logistic expert. You're there to live your life. So we want to take care of all your logis logistic decisions. You can focus on what's important for you. And that's what Amazon is really good at. And when you look into what Amazon has been doing in the beginning, they've understood that selling book is a vertical with many aspects that inform you how to turn a vertical into a horizontal to create a matrix that improves people's lives, logistic decisions, making things seamless for you. That's what, the, that's what their mission is. So what is the difference? Exponential organizations, we call this, they're building operating systems. So human have, humans have emotions, they have needs, they have desires, they have worries, they have wishes, all these sorts of emotions that everyone knows and has. And an operating system basically means that you create something upon which you can create the market space. Because the market space is, as we know it from the ancient market spaces, the same in the digital market spaces, that you create a platform where people can produce something, sell something, make money, something, expose themselves, um, express themselves, and be part of something that's bigger than themselves while making money and the person or the company who creates the market spaces takes a share. And when you look into the bubbles of the market space, it starts with one person that attracts another set of people who attract another set of people. And that's when you just make the numbers game that draws a beautiful exponential curve. So I'm not giving you the hockey shit curve here. A few aspects of an indicator of linear organizations. One, as I said before, the idea of competition is outdated. Um, competition basically means, as I said before, that you position yourself as number two all of the time. So if you want to be number one, you can look at what your competitor is doing because they're also facing the same fears and doubts and questions and uncertainties. There is a different approach. Second part of a linear organization is that they have higher internal processes than external delivery. I was working for Siemens a year, many years ago and we're building a, a, a network of teams in Europe for the mobile business. And there were so many processes that I asked themselves how long if the last customer would leave the building, how long would you continue having the same workload? And I said, two months. 
or being a little cynical, they might have not realized that we have a Corona crisis because they still have the same workload, even though that eight weeks ago, the last customer has left the building. No, I'm kidding. But the problem is that they have 80% internal processes and only 20% external delivery. When you get close to a number like this, you know that you're in trouble. Um, one big aspect, and that's also something where I, what I enjoy a lot in Silicon Valley is making money is not their number one KPI. And as a matter of fact, when you understand, and Ray Kurzweil puts it nicely, and it's been quoted many times, I'm sorry, Peter Diamandis, if you want to be a billionaire, you have to change the life of one billion people. And what this sentence basically says is that you understand what problems do you need to solve for people. And if you do this successfully, they will pay you for that. It's not something bad making money, but it shouldn't be your first agenda. And it's more than semantic. It's actually a mindset. Scale products, I mentioned that before. Another thing that confuses people a lot is the collaboration. I think that collaboration is an outdated concept. Collaboration basically means that you have a lot of meetings. And I don't know a lot of people who really love and enjoy meetings. And the purpose of a meeting is to get everyone on the same page. Because I don't know how many meetings you've attended and really got the, the project to the next level. It felt more like, okay, now everyone knows what we're doing. We assign new tasks and then people go work. And that makes the whole process slow and maybe also turns into a process full of compromises of which I define as a something, as a solution where all parties are equally unhappy. So um, what instead, we, we would say that coordination is the better term that we should use. And coordination basically means that you own the skills of design intrinsic motivation because you have to make things, if you're a leader, you should be able to make things important for people. And I'm going to go into this a little later. There is a momentum about the word problem. I think we're calling the wrong word, the wrong situations problem, and we're calling the wrong situations a challenge. As we, as we call every little thing a problem, like every little headache is a problem, um, once we face a real problem, nobody really understands that we should solve it because we're so used to the term problem that we forgot to use it when it's really important. But um, when you call a headache a challenge, that's fair enough because you don't have to you don't have to face it, right? You can face it or not. But when you start calling problems a problem, everyone wants to solve them. So I would suggest that you would stop calling things that are not a problem a problem to free up that word that's such an important word for things that should be solved. And if you want to solve a problem, you have to make it big to create alertness. And when you're there to have enough alertness, you have to make it small. So that sounds a little weird and complicated, but in the first place, you have to make it big so everyone understands that this is something we should solve. When you have these people agreeing on identifying a problem or identifying something that needs to be solved of course you have to make it slow uh, sorry small otherwise people will feel overwhelmed with solving it but that's a totally different story another aspect that you see a lot also in silicon valley is um that concept of control that concept of come when you want and go when you want and everyone knows and it goes a little with this designing of intrinsic motivation everyone knows how their contribution is to get things done to not stop to not make the progress slow and if you work in a team and you're that person who always runs late, who never uh, completes and contributes, you probably are the wrong person in the team. But if you understand what you're doing, you don't need meetings because you know what you're doing and just doing it. So you don't want anything that slows you down. You want progress. You want things moving on. And I hope that makes sense so far because where we're jumping into is um, basically what's so special with Silicon Valley. And I mentioned before, it to me, the most crucial element is that this is a mindset. Maybe some basics about um, Silicon Valley per definition. And this is one of the illustrations that most people agree upon. Some would say that the East Bay, so Oakland and Fremont and um, San Leandro and Hayward, these parts that are not even um, circulated right now, are also part of Silicon Valley and why exclude South San Francisco and San Mateo. So there are several different definitions. It's not a geographical term. The geographical term is actually Santa Clara Valley. And so Santa Clara Valley goes along the San Andreas Fault to the Pacific. Um, so Silicon Valley is a made up term. Um, 1970 was it coined the first time. One third of all US venture capital tra is traded in Silicon Valley. Um, Yes, that's more of a reader and you can go back there. I think what's interesting is when you look into some of the big, biggest companies of the world and you just highlight the headquarters, you can see that there's really a lot of world's innovation is happening in Silicon Valley, which is, of course, based on many things. I mentioned money before. Another foundation of being innovative is education. So when you pick some of the Silicon Valley universities, I think there's a total of 80 universities in Silicon Valley. 
and you highlight more of some of the more famous ones like Carnegie Mellon who, who have a campus there um, or Stanford or Singularity or UC Berkeley uh, or UCSF uh, or HALT. There, there are so many really well, world renowned and really good at in education institutions over there. I highlighted Coxwell College uh, and I'm sure that none of you knows Coxwell College. It's actually the second oldest college in Silicon Valley who always understood what do we need to educate our students on what skills do they need to have in the next five years or two years? And they started with educating firefighters because in um, a change of century, 120 years ago, um, San Francisco burned down in, a fire, in an earthquake. So an earthquake caused a fire and half of the city burned down. So firefighters was the, the, the skill that people should have to be ready for another earthquake and be ready to make sure that that, that whole thing doesn't burn down. And now they're a, a multimedia design um, university because that's what they understand is a skill that that people should know and we're going to meet Julius, Dob Julius Dobos, Dobos actually he's a Hungarian uh, on Friday to me one of the most inspiring educators he is and that's probably all for the universities and students and faculty people in this group and an exciting meeting to have and conversation to have I'm really looking forward to to meeting to having him in this in this program um, so um, how about the Silicon Valley myth? It feels like when you when you put your steps in Stanford, it feels like you're already smart, but that's of course the, the way it doesn't work. But what I have to tell you is that I'm by local in Vienna and in San Francisco. Whenever I go to San Francisco, I feel like it makes a difference when you have conversations about self-driving cars in Austria and you, you see 40 self-driving cars every day in San Francisco. And it's just, to pick one of the core innovations that are going to change the narrative in the next five years, maybe even less. Um, it's not something to talk about when you see it every day. It's not, is it going to happen or when is it going to happen? It's the question, the conversation that we have about um, self-driving cars is, what is going to be the difference? What's going to change? And not when, it's, when is it happening or, or is it happening at all? And the question about when is it happening, I, I don't think that there is any question that could be more irrelevant. Because you know it's going to start. I had a conversation with a pharmaceutical company near Frankfurt, and I asked them uh, how many of them. So there were 80 people in the room, and I asked them how many of you think that 3D printers will shape the future of medication. And everyone's hands was up. And I asked them, "Where's your 3D printer?" And I said, "We don't have a 3D printer." So don't ask yourself when is it going to happen or how long it's going to take. Ask yourself what does it mean for us and you can only ask yourself what does it mean for us or what does it mean for myself when you expose yourself to this technology right now because right now is the time for learning and tinkering so experiment is a big topic and we're going to go into we're going to talk about growth hacking during the course of the week where experiment is the focus also for me a very relevant and important aspect of silicon valley mindset However, there are 1,000 incorporations a week. And when you look into the next slide, you see that six months later, there are only nine left as a company. And that could be called a failure engine. Or you can also call it as something that's in, at turbo speed. People learn what works and what does not work. And that's probably something that's very um, different to other places in the world, where if I would tell my father, I'm one of the 1,000 companies of which nine of them will exist six months later, he would probably advise me to apply for a job at Henkel or Siemens or maybe IBM or whatever. Um, you, have, you, must be, you must have this mindset. You must embrace the concept of thousand to nine is a good thing and not a bad thing. So I mentioned before um, the magic sauce of Silicon Valley is distinguished between method and mindset. So right now we're going to go into design thinking, which is the first part of the, of the meetings that we're going to have. Design thinking with the business model canvas. This is why I, I, I've shared with you that slide that you go, can, can look into this um, or use this, but this is following the design thinking. We're basically talking about design thinking 3.0, where the first phase of design thinking can be called the industrial revolution. And the second one, that the process of design thinking that we've talked about since Kelly and Hasso Plattner founded the school or the HPE in, in, in Potsdam in Germany where they, they determined that everything is designed, everything can be designed and if you want to design a good product you have to understand that this process starts with understanding, identifying, ideating, prototyping. Um, one of the most inspiring people that I love to have conversations with, he says um, a prototype is more worth than 1,000 meetings. 
So how soon can we go into a prototype, which is something that's very Silicon Valley specific that they, you can distinguish between raw resolution, medium resolution, high resolution prototype. The raw resolution prototype is something that you basically do in the first meeting. And how can you turn, and there's a lot more behind that, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go into this at a later stage if we, if, if we can find the time for this. Um, how can you turn everything into a prototype? How can you start thinking in prototyping? I must make my idea tangible. Because um, um, otherwise we talk about interpretation and that doesn't put you any further because interpretation means I share my idea and eight people have a different approach to the idea that I'm sharing with you. Of course, you need to validate this because you can sponsor innovation. You must figure out if this is going to be a business model or not, and then you start iterating. And this is a very fast process that basically loops until you um, don't want anymore. It's not a thing that you do and then you're done, right? It's kind of a website. It's a living process. Um, of course, you want to launch, but you measure everything that you're doing to go back into growing your point of view on where you are with your concept, because that's probably also the difference between all these established organizations. They have an idea, a concept, a strategy, and then just execute. But if you think in a world where everything we know from technology is five years ahead of technology, so five years further than what you can buy on the market, and it takes you a year to develop something and to deploy a product, you're basically working with something that's six years old. So what you need to change is that going away from ideation to execution which might cost you a year maybe six months a year maybe 18 months time that you will never be able to catch up into something that's more of a constant evolving and constantly growing um and and improving process because life is a series of events as i said before so you have to think about all the things that are happening before during and after interactions and um that leads me to that last conceptual slide of design thinking Technology is just a part of it. Uh, the, the digital transformation is a trap. Digital transformation means that you spend a lot of money to get up to date with technology. As I mentioned earlier, it's you, you're never up to date with technology because what's available is old technology. So you have to think in a different, different approach. And the approach in Silicon Valley is problem focused. What problem can we solve? How can we identify a problem? How can we solve it with what we're good at? So we're talking about human values. Of course, we want to see businesses, but we take advantage of technology that's available and if it's not available, we, we just develop technology. So um, probably you've heard about this concept of moonshot thinking, and I'm I'm closing I'm closing this slides um, in a few minutes with um, one of our participants quote that I I just love because I think it's a life motto. Let's go into moonshot thinking, and there are a few thoughts and aspects. There's actually twenty of them that I'm going to share with you. First of them is what does work mean for you? Um, is that is that something that you distinguish from this separate from life is this something that's part of your life or is this something that is your life is this something that's your occupation that may or might not bring money into the pockets um i work 30 percent of my work i work for free because i think that when you work for free you educate yourself in what decisions do i make if i don't if they're not money driven which are always the better decisions so I can only recommend um, everyone to get rid of this feeling that work is something that I do from Monday to Friday to afford my weekend, because that would just kill you. Moving on. Um, I would say that the number one driver of being really good is not a really good idea, but a really good, um, really high level of caring, a high level of important it is. So if you own a project, you have to make it important for everyone. Otherwise, it will not be good. No matter how good your people are, if you don't make it important for them, it will not be good. And if it doesn't, if it's already not important for you, you can never make it for people who work for you. You can never, never make it more important than it is for you. So how can I set my own bar if I'm project leader of importance? How can I make the whole thing more important? Because that determines how good the end result will be. If we go to conferences, because there are so many TEDx people in this group, the curator cares more than the speaker and the speaker cares more than the audience. Or in other words, the speaker cares less than the curator and the audience cares less than the speaker. If I'm curator and I, I invite the speaker coach to work with my speakers, every talk will get better. Not because the speaker coach, not necessarily because the speaker coach is doing such a good job, but because of the fact, and I would say 80% or 70% at least, because of the fact that there is a speaker coach, that speaker will not prepare to talk before, the day before the conference, but already a month before the conference, he will look into how to put this talk in a really good, turn this talk into a really good experience for himself and also for his audience. So making things important is a very crucial aspect. 
in Silicon Valley, the term ownership has been used a lot, but it's been used over capacity now, so I'm refraining from it. I think everyone understands what it means to make things important, and that's what it's about. Um, as I said before, as a, as a company, don't try to improve what you're already good at. That might not solve your innovation problems. As I said before, mechanics try to produce better cars, but the future is not within the better car. The future is in the car that's a data mining device. And I'm going to go into this as, as we go, because I think this is a very, I'm excited about this conversation. A lot of people who are aficionados of cars, they, they enjoy the conversation as well. I recently met the guy who runs Cyberloop, uh, Hyperloop, sorry, Hyperloop One in Dubai. And he says, we should get away from the concept of incremental change. Incremental change will never lead us anywhere because if people are unhappy with the situation and you improve the situation gradually, they're just gradually less unhappy. But no one is happy only because they're less unhappy. So it needs, it's, we're in a time where it really requires radical change, where it really requires to stop things and doing th something completely new and not transform. The word transformation is actually a trap because sometimes it's not a transformation, sometimes it's a jump. As I said before, we fall in love with the problem and not the solution. Um, when you fall in love with the problem, you, you understand the problem a lot better. When you fall in love with the solution, you might not even recognize that the solution, that the problem has changed and the solution is not the right one anymore. Um, and that's along the way, a good method, a good ethic, a good, good model to follow by. People in Silicon Valley, they completely lack envy and jealousy. It's not, it's not about, um, I don't know, in Austria, I feel like it's a good country to start unless, until you become more successful than your neighbor, because then people start um, making life complicated for you. That's just not existence. And I think there are some aspects of human behavior that block innovation, that in the nature of this aspect is blocks innovation. Right? If you're envious your neighbor or if you're jealous of someone else's success, how can you become more successful than that person? Data over opinion. Everything that you do can, produces information and that information should, um, should be relevant for your future decisions. And when we go into the design thinking process, every, every progress, this information feeds back into the next decision that already changes the journey. Um, there, when we talk about growth hacking and we talk about ideas, ideas, I think a good example because when you share someone an idea, very often the person responds and I like it or I don't like it. But that's completely irrelevant. And what the, what the growth hackers did, and we're going to hear this from Frederick this week, um, they convert an idea into a data set and they, they separate the ideas so the metrics are impact, confidence and ease. And you give each of these elements a number from, I don't know, let's say five to zero to 10, zero to five. And then every idea becomes a number and you just decide you don't follow any idea that's under 13. So you only produce 13, 14 and 15, that, that number from that metrics and the rest you, you don't follow. Even if you might have liked the idea or you dislike the one that you're following, it's irrelevant. We live in Silicon Valley, we live very strongly by the concept of mentor and mentee. Um, we can talk about this later. I just want to leave it like that. There's so much to talk about mentorship and being um, a mentee of someone. Play forward is a good way to live by instead of asking you what's in it for me. Um, it comes in Silicon Valley. It comes from this concept of paid forward, where a VC or an investor or a successful and wealthy person supported someone with an idea with his money. So he came. I give you just to give you an example. I give you two hundred thousand dollars because I like you. And when you are successful, I don't want the money back and I don't want equity, but I want you to do the same. Because if everyone plays it forward, if everyone pays it forward, well, all you get is actually a growing ecosystem of, of success stories. Or in other words, as one of my friends said, if you want to um, raise the water, you have to elevate the ships. Embrace serendipity. Um, it's a beautiful term that I'm always having a hard time to translate into German. I think serendipity is the reason why you have huge coffee shops and huge kitchens every, every other corner of these big spaces because everyone needs a coffee. Everyone is going somewhere for a break from his work. And then um, just by occasion, you might sit next to someone from a completely different department or from a completely different discipline. They're having a conversation. They're figuring out that they have something in common. That's serendipity. You don't go to a conference because of the speaker. You go to a conference with a social agenda, how today I want to talk about education, and then you know you're kind of, that's your no star. 
then you know that you're going to have a conversation or many conversations about education because that's your social agenda whenever you go. And that's very, that's the engine of serendipity. Um, I think it was Asso Tello who said the illiterate of the future are not those who can't read and write, but those who can't learn, unlearn and relearn. How much of what we've learned can we agree on letting go because it might not true at the anymore? Uh, the most inspiring book that I've read um, in the past, I would say 20 years was a book of a German called Heinz von Förster. And the book was, it, I read it in German, but the English title was The Truth is an Invention of a Liar, which basically gives you the idea that truth is very temporary and not something you can rely on for the next 20 years. And there is so much to go into this. I, I really love this concept because if you understand that you can let go of truth, life is a lot easier. I would just recommend stop reading self-improvement books. I think that after the second self-improvement book, you know the spiel, you know the shtick, and then you just have to, you have to do, you can't download experience. You have to, you have to see what works for you and what does not work for you. And I see so many people in management asking me constantly if I read this book or the latest book on this or the latest book on that. And I, I just, I mean, there are so many books that I love reading and I've read a few self-improvement books and I've, I, I sometimes I still do because I think they're inspiring me for way of thinking, but generally I think um, they don't, they don't get you anywhere. Um, yes. It's not going to be easy. Whatever you do, you're going to face headwind. I, I just want to mention this. Also don't carry around your success stories. You're as good as the last thing that you have done. I don't think that there's so much more to go into here. Um, everyone probably knows what's, what's meant by the statement. Don't be arrogant, don't be judgy. Um, be, express yourself, even in a radical way. There is nothing wrong with following your inner voice for doing what you're passionate about. If you, if you do this, you start standing for something. And if you start standing for something, you become a go-to. Um, be inclusive, not exclusive. I think that's also something that's very specific to certain Valley that you say yes to all and no, not, um, you don't belong here. You're not part of this conversation. You, you just en en encourage everything that comes. Improv, when we talk about self-improvement, improv was the last literature that I took and I really enjoyed this. And one of the maxims of improv is take everything as a gift. Everything that comes to you as a gift. Um, is a completely different mindset and opens up to an inclusive way of looking in the world. Also a weird thing that I see in Europe is that we have this strange approach to being rich. Or maybe maybe it's just outside, I said before, Silicon Valley, 120 square kilometers, kilometers surrounded by reality. Maybe it's not only a Europe thing, but I feel like a lot of people have a very weird approach to wealth. Um, it's okay to be rich, even if it's your neighbor. It's not something bad. It's not something bad to be successful. It's not something bad to make money. It's not something bad to identify something that's making money. It's not exploitative if you just have an idea that, that brings money into your pockets. You don't have to be ashamed for this. I think that one of the reasons why many people are not rich is because they're ashamed to make too much money. There is so much, also there are so many concepts in literature about your um, financial thermostat. I don't know if you ever heard that term before. But if you're okay to making a million a year, you probably don't make anything under 200,000. If you're okay to making 10,000 a year, you probably make 8,000 a year. Um, what's your financial term? What's okay, what's this, what's the, what the, which amount of money to make a year is okay for you before it feels awkward? Giving feedback is, um, is actually a social, social skill. Very often we give feedback and then the moment we hear the response of the person we gave feedback to is the moment where we regret it for the first time that we gave feedback. So it's very much about articulation, but it's also very much about how are we giving feedback and to who am I giving feedback. Very often people give feedback to the world if they disagree and don't say anything if they agree. And I love the idea of if you disagree with what I'm saying, tell it to me because that helps me getting better. I love feedback. It's, I think it's a gift. But if you tell it anyone out there, I don't, I, I don't have the chance of having a conversation about it. It's nothing bad with feedback. It's nothing bad with negative feedback. But please, if you agree, you don't have to tell me. I'm not, positive feedback is not my fuel. But if you share it with the rest of the world, that attracts people to the table. And I love to have conversations about how I can make their lives better. And here is Adam. Um, <laughs> I love this quote and I'm always, I always coining it, I always putting it there because I think it's so right. If you think of something big and it's doable, you just don't think big enough. And I think this is a way more beautiful way of raising the concept of you must be scared of your ideas, otherwise they're not big ideas. Um, 
there are there are there are places and companies and mindsets when you meet them in person you you know what this means you feel like wherever you start they're taking the conversation to a different level and it's so much of an enjoyment to have that conversation with these people because you never thought about that direction that dimension and um it's just an amazing feeling to see things growing and when you already see the final product you see an end state to things you see an end stage to things and i think end stages are tricky difficult so i love to end this intro presentation by quoting adam who's among us here and i hope that's okay for you adam yeah thank you <laughs> And that was really very fast. I know that um, um, maybe maybe a little too fast um, because there are so many thoughts that should have planted seeds in your brains to enjoy having a conversation just about the thought. I'm, I'm also always there for you guys. You can always get you a calendar entry in my calendar for a one-on-one -on -one conversation to go back to some of the, the items that I've discussed here to go deeper the better understand or to challenge or to question. But I would like to use the next five minutes together with you for some first feedback, first thoughts. Um, how do you feel about it? Um, does that work for you? Or is this weird or whatever, whatever your thoughts are right now? I'd love to go into this. Well, I took like a page and a half of notes, so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks, Nikki. Um, when I started to look up, I, I was like thinking like I was I was right there and <laughs> getting all the insights and and especially these twenty points were really yeah I really like that because it's yeah it's kind of mind shift and uh, yeah that's what the world needs outside of Silicon Valley. Thank yes. you for that. Thank you. Anyone, I anyone have, just, yes, I can come in. Uh, and um, I was thinking about the, the change, the incremental and radical, actually. And one of the things that I am, I wouldn't say struggling with, but I think I'm trying to figure out a different way of thinking is uh, the education problem in India. And um, I feel that a lot of my efforts have maybe been more incremental. And I keep thinking of, I need to do some kind of radical thing to really shake things up. Um, and my question maybe is, you know, who gets to decide what kind of, you know, whether it's incremental or radical. I mean, sometimes your perspective might be that, you know, let me go for the radical thing, but actually what works for the situation is incremental. So if you've got some insight or maybe some, some, you know, case study of, of how do we kind of adopt what kind of change uh, situation we go for? Probably. Maybe, maybe to, and thank you for this question, and maybe to answer it, let me give you a little um, a broader, um, broader perspective on what I think here is um, the problem when we talk about education, for example. I think um, a lot of conversations about education are about the teachers and the students, and maybe the parents, Everyone, like the, the, the intermediate stakeholders of education. And I think that when we talk, talk about countries that are maybe a little trickier, we should think about getting that conversation on a different table. Why? I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure, and please tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that some governments in the world don't want to have highly educated citizens. They don't want to have, uh, they don't want their people in the country to be too educated and i think if you if what would happen if education would be something where governments would say okay i'm open to every experiment whereas constantly forcing and fighting for regu for regulations and for laws and for what's okay and what's not okay i don't think that i think that governments failed in like finally fa failed in deciding what's good for education and whatnot and i think there are so many amazing concepts that have been tried out and satellite concepts in the world that seem to have interesting trajectories and seem to be interesting but they're not really taking off for whatever reasons what if um that whole concept of education would um as i said one discussion be on a different table 
and um, away from political decision. Because we, I mean, we've all seen, everyone from the TEDx community knows um, what Sugatva Mita has done. I think that's not incremental change in education. And I think that's very radical. And it basically just pointed on the fact that everyone's, everyone, every human is curious. We just learn to be uncurious. We just learn to be not curious anymore. But every, every individual wants to learn. Right? You, every individual wants to improve the situation until he learned that improving the situation harms his life. So the, the lesser problem is to keep the situation alive. But when we were born, we started to walk and we started to talk and no one ever said, and our first words were ridiculous, but no one ever said, stop talking, this is never going to work. Our parents applauded to every little thing that sounded like a word and we got that feedback of improving. But then we started singing or dancing and people said, you can't sing, you can't dance. And we, I mean, we know all these stories. Um, I don't know if that, that gives kind of a direction of the answer. It's not an answer, but it's maybe a direction of the answer. Um, there is, there is, there, we just have to stop um, killing curiosity and killing that like, desire of learning. And I think it's kind of, you're, you're happy. I think you're happy by default or most of the people are happy by default. So you just have to remove everything out of your life that makes you unhappy because what remains is being happy. So you can de 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 define things by the presence of things or you can define things by the absence of things. And I think that with education, maybe there's too much presence of control. And I don't know if that makes sense for you, but I think if you can, if you have the conversation about removing, taking control out of the equation, then you open up the conversation about um, radical change versus incremental change. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's an interesting way of looking at it. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to kind of keeping it in my mind and like whatever that I kind of pick up from, from these sessions, it'll be interesting to go back and reflect. Okay.